Hey everyone, it's Jen. And this is Lindsay. And welcome back to Corpus Delicti, the podcast. We are almost wrapping up our missing series. Yeah, so we have this episode that we're about to get into, and then we will have two more, but those two more are both Patreon. They are part of this series. They are stories within this series, but they are from Patreon. So we'll have the one from October and then the one from November as well. So you still have two more stories coming, but just keep in mind with those. They are sometimes a little shorter, don't necessarily sound the same, not edited the same. So just know that those are coming, but that's when we will be celebrating Thanksgiving and then going to Atlanta for the live show. So we're really excited. And then after that, Keep in mind, we will be off for the rest of the year. I think it's like that ends up being three weeks in December or something like that. And we're working during that time on something really um, big, potentially big. So that's all I'll say. So we'll, we'll leave that hint right there yeah. and jump into the story because this episode takes us back to a place we've been before during the series, which we'll explain once we get to that part. But in fact, this is two separate stories that tie back into one. July 5th, 1991, 11-year-old Charles Arlen Leon Henderson. Most often, he went by Arlen. He, Arlen was riding out on his yellow and white bike, which he called White Lightning, by the way, while his mother was getting dinner ready. And this bike was a Huffy brand, and it had black accents on the seat. Arlen had told his mom, save me some Polish sausage, and then he headed outside to go play. So he was right in the area of the family's mobile home in the early evening around 5, 530. They lived in Moscow Mills, Missouri, which is north of St. Louis. And so he is seen at that time between 5 and 530, and he's looking to see what friends might be outside who he can hang out with. But that is the last time that Arlen Henderson was seen. So a little bit of background on Arlen. He was born March 16th, 1980. His mother was Debbie Henderson Griffith. His father had unfortunately passed away of emphysema in 1990. So when Debbie called Arlen in for dinner, he didn't come. So she goes outside. She's looking around. Where is he? And then she starts to realize that something is wrong. He cannot be found. So she calls the police and a search was started. Now, as we've so often heard in this series, authorities and volunteers flock to help. This went on for several days across Lincoln County, but there is no sign of Arlen. And at the time, Arlen is described as a young white male. He's got blonde hair, blue eyes. At the time, he had a crew cut and he had a scar on his thigh and a gap between his teeth. Now he was wearing a camouflage print t-shirt with matching camouflage print pants with a tear in one knee, gray socks with red stripes and black sneakers. According to the Charlie Project, Arlen's mom describes him as just a very fun loving boy and he enjoyed telling stories, he loved swimming, diving, and bike riding. His favorite school subjects were social studies and science. So Arlen's mom essentially turns her home into this command center. And she even started a new telephone line just strictly dedicated to Arlen's case. So people weren't calling her house with tips. She could keep this all separate. She used what she called lead sheets to collect info. So she was very organized keeping all of this, you know, lining it out, coming up with timelines anytime anyone called. It wasn't until 11 weeks after his disappearance that any sort of clue at all turned up, and Arlen's bike was found in a bean field. This field was on North Ethlin Road, and it was about 10 miles from Arlen's home. It was found by a farmer in a bunch of weeds. On the bike... They did find a set of fingerprints, but again, as we know, that's only useful if you have something or someone, rather, to match them back to. So, of course, these prints were put on file, and they noted that Arlen's bike was in good condition. It hadn't been wrecked, damaged. It was clean. The tires were still inflated, and 
Authorities believed that the bike was put there in that field, not by Arlen, but by someone else. This bike was really hushed-hushed. The police didn't say a word about it publicly. And it was one of those cards that, you know, they were just going to hold close to because at this point, they have no other leads. Debbie recalls that when they found the bike, I thought, all right, now we've got answers. We're going to know what happened. Unfortunately, though, it just wasn't the case. And the case goes cold. A long and agonizing 10 years goes by. It's now 2001, and a huge break into the case comes out. The break in the case was from a man called Josh Spangler. Now, Josh confesses to the murdering of Arlen Henderson. Spangler's 23 years old. So, if you're doing the math in your head like I am, that would have put Josh 13 years old at the time. Now, remember, his bike was clean, tires inflated, there was no sign of damage around the bean field. So, just keep that in the back of your mind. His story says that he was actually selling drugs for two brothers, George and Charles, who went by Chucky Gibson. One of the Arlen's family members owed Chucky money, and Spangler was hired to kill Arlen as a warning or some type of a threat to the family to pay up. So he goes on to say that he was riding with George Gibson that night. They abducted Arlen and they held him in a house for several days before the Gibson brothers paid him $10,000 to shoot Arlen. He claims that he was the one who shot Arlen in the head with a 9 millimeter pistol in a creek bed near Davis on July 28th, which was three days after Arlen was abducted. He says then that they buried him along the Mississippi River. So naturally, soon thereafter, George and Chucky Gibson are arrested and authorities are searching all of the areas that were mentioned by Spangler. Nothing was found. So let's pause here for a second because, like Jen alluded to, here's the story. 13-year-old helps kidnap and murder an 11-year-old. Says to the police, it's because someone owed the money. He also says that they keep Arlen alive for several days before killing him, for which he was then paid 10000 to carry that out. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Why would you keep someone alive if you're planning on killing them to send a message and leaving him alive? You can risk him escaping. You're abducting an 11-year-old, but you're only 13 yourself. So... It sounds a little weird, and the police agreed, because there are a lot of inconsistencies in the story. So for one, they couldn't even tie Spangler to the brothers. So they're questioning friends, family, and the brothers, the Gibson brothers, had insisted, we don't even know this Spangler guy. And this seemed to somewhat track, because no one could corroborate that they even knew each other. Then additionally, the property where Spangler said that they kept Arlen could not be tied to the brothers either. They didn't own it. They didn't know anyone who lived there. They weren't related to anyone who lived there. And also, originally, Spangler said, yeah, they paid me $10,000. Well, later, the story changed, and he says that he was actually paid in drugs. And that's a big difference. Cash and drugs, that's a big difference. Now, remember, they've arrested two other people in relation to this. And this is when they learned that Josh Spangler, he lied. He lied. He made the whole thing up. The police said, yeah, we didn't think the guy had anything to do with it. But he did just seriously perjure himself. So he was charged for that. Josh pled guilty and was sentenced to seven years in prison. Why in the world would you, would you say when you were 13, you committed this, bring two people in, Lie about it. Get caught lying because you're going to get caught lying. It is just an obscene story. But they said that he made up the story as a very malicious joke to make the police look incompetent. He would have not served any time in prison for this part of the crime because of his age. So for whatever reason, he lies about a crime that he can't be prosecuted for. But because he is not the sharpest tool in the shed, he gets caught lying, and now he gets to sit in prison for jail or jail 
for seven years. So originally, he did plead guilty to first-degree murder. So this is how this went down. But he was set free because of the age. And that is because in Missouri, you can only be charged to age 21 if you're a minor. And he was past that age now. So let's just say, theoretically, he's he wants to make the police look bad. He knows, oh, I could have only served time till I was 21. I, I'm 23 now. So they can't really pin me for this. So I can make up this story and I'm not going to serve time for it. But again, it got a little messy. He didn't really back up and couldn't back up anything that he said, got caught. And I just want to know his motive behind this. Was it straight credibility? Was I mean, it just to make the police look incompetent? Are you willing to put your head on the chopping block for that? I, it's, it seems a little extreme. But regardless, at the time of that plea that he gave, He was serving a four-year prison sentence for unrelated charges of burglary and evidence tampering. But then, 10 years after the disappearance, tragedy did strike Arlen's family again, and Arlen's sister was murdered. She was killed by her estranged husband, who then took his own life. And just to be crystal clear, it was not related to Arlen's case at all. There is no reason to believe that. It is just this horrific, heartbreaking tragedy. I cannot even imagine what this family has been through. All right, we're going to pause on Arlen's story because there is another twist and turn to this that we want to get to, and we're going to get to that as soon as we come back from the break. All right, so let's get back to the story, and we're going to time travel back to June 8th, 1988. We're going to be in St. Charles, Missouri. So we're about three years before Arlen's story. Nine-year-old Scott Clay Schulte lived on the 3300 block of Leverance Drive with his parents, Richard and Peggy. June 8th was the last day of school. He gets home. He's going outside to play. Summer vacation's here. He's excited. He left his home and headed towards the woods. He was last seen walking down Ken Drive about 4.30. It was only a block away from his house. So late that afternoon, a big thunderstorm came through the area, and it kind of came out of nowhere. It was one of those, we know here in the South, those late afternoon pop-up storms that you may or may not be prepared for. And Scott did not come home during the storm, but his family wasn't worried because they're like, well, he was outside playing. This came on pretty quick. He probably went to a friend's house in the neighborhood to get out of the rain before coming home. Side note here, Peggy, his mother, was not home when Scott went outside. She had not gotten home from work yet. She came home a bit later than normal that day because she got stuck at work, essentially. But then the storm ends, everything clears up, and Scott never returned home. So at first, they wondered, did he get carried off by a flash flood? Did he maybe drown? Something like that. So of course, the police were called and a search began. There were police officers, students from the police academy, and 40 civilians. And in total, they searched about 20 acres over several days. This included the woods where he played, the railroad tracks. They even went into some nearby caves that Scott's friends said that they sometimes played in. They drained water in local streams. They're pulling out all the stops here, but nothing at all was found. They go door to door. They use helicopters. They use scent dogs, which did pick up his scent for about a mile and a half. The scent was later lost at an apartment building being built. They even used infrared equipment to search the sewers. They were about as thorough as they could be. They left no stone unturned. His football coach even helped search on his own. He said that the team could have 22 kids. And he would cap it at 21 and save that spot for Scott. So it would be waiting on him when Scott was found. So they were keeping a a position for him on the team, which was just heart melting. At the time of the disappearance, Scott was described as a young white male with brown hair and blue eyes. Sounds familiar a little bit, doesn't it? He was born on April 12th, 1979. He is about four feet, four inches tall and weighed about 60 pounds. Uh, He He had freckles on his nose and three small molds on his face and a small scar on his chin. 
He was last seen wearing a black t-shirt that said, Rude Dog, khaki pants, red and black Puma high top sneakers. Scott's brother Richard said on Nancy Grace, quote, They tell you not to play in the streets, but that's where we'd play. Up on the top of the streets, that's where he was. There was a neighborhood full of a hundred kids, probably five minutes from our house. There was nothing but farmlands and fields and dirt trails, stuff like that. So one investigator said that the woods in the area where he would go, it was really overgrown and they said it might be really hard to find a child's body unless you were essentially right on top of it. I mean, he doesn't weigh a lot. I I, I think that this is about Emmett's size, you know, and he's he's pretty small, so they're saying the the brush and the overgrowth would have hidden so, someone that small unless you were right up on him. So they're starting to get concerned about, we know we've been thorough, but did it? Did he blend in potentially? Did we miss something? So one person did say that she saw Scott near the caves right before the storm. But again, those caves had been searched to the best of anyone's ability. Several psychics did come forward with theories, but none proved fruitful. In 2011, there was some sort of tip. Although we don't know the specific details, this tip led the police to review the case and re-interview some of the neighbors. They actually ended up getting a search warrant for a home near the family, brought out dogs, drilled through the concrete in some of areas, but nothing is found and we don't know exactly who it was or why they would give this tip. Now, two more years go by. In 2013, a former police officer who turned informant said that he was incarcerated in St. Charles, Missouri. And while he was there, he got written documentation of the details of not only Scott's disappearance, but for 13 to 15 other victims that he claimed were all perpetrated by the same man between the years of 1978 and 2005. These were all supposedly young children and women. So a cop turned bad in jail turned informant against somebody who committed crimes against 13 to 15 people, child, children and women. The informant is Chuck Maselli. Chuck sent a letter to the Post-Dispatch and said that he went to the media just to make sure There was absolute transparency. The St. Charles, Missouri prosecutor said that they looked into it and they couldn't find anything to prove this, but they were always keeping that option open and would continue to look at it. So then in 2016, another possible theory came about and this took place on Reddit, which we've talked about before. You got to take everything there with a grain of salt, but you never know what you're going to find. And this was an anonymous post. And here is what it said. This still haunts me to this day. As kids, we had a hideout in this dirt cliff cove. This is the best approximation I can find on Google. Only three times taller and probably ten times as wide. So he linked a picture of what he was trying to describe. There was a neighborhood kid who, in hindsight, was probably mentally handicapped in some way. But to us, he was just the weird, creepy kid. This was the 80s, and we weren't exactly raised politically correct. Three of us were headed to our base and found creepy kids sitting at the top in our, quote, guard chair. We yelled at him to get out, and he said something like, make me, and started lobbing dirt clods and sticks down at us. We all ran around the side to make our way up. It gets pretty fuzzy here, but all I remember is he fell. I still remember the sound. When we got back down to check on him, he was in a very awkward position with blood coming out of his mouth. We all just freaked out and ran home, and as far as I know, no one has spoken a word of this to anyone. We didn't go back for over a month and never said a word of it between us. Again, this was in the 80s, so media wasn't like today. Chances are it got a small article in the newspaper, B section, missing mentally disabled child found dead after fall or something like that. So that's the post, and someone who commented on the post, this post kind of kind of blew up because they're like, oh my gosh, you left someone there who was in that bad of shape and was laying funny and all that, 
So one of the commenters got really curious about it, and they did some digging to find out more about who posted this. Now, FYI, that post is no longer there. It has been removed. But they found out that this was posted from the same area in Missouri, and a lot of the info fit. So the area, the age, all that seemed to fit Scott. So they did tell police about this, but police haven't been able to substantiate any of it either. And they still believe that he was abducted. And I have not been able to find anything to say that Scott was, as the poster said, potentially mentally handicapped, weird, or creepy. Like in all the articles about him, no one said anything about him having trouble making friends or having any kind of condition or anything like that. There was nothing. And I specifically searched on that. So I don't know if that matters or not. But there was nothing that could be found to officially link that to Scott. Now, you must be thinking, why the heck are we talking about these two cases? And why are they separate? Well, let's take a step back to a case we discussed a few weeks ago, Bianca Piper. If the area and the caves in some of the area we've talked about tonight sounds familiar, it's because these two cases were in the same area as Bianca Piper. Now, remember how... There were when it seemed a lot of children missing in this area at the time. And we even commented on it. You know, this just seems a whole heck of a lot of kids in a short time period. Well, these two boys were looked at as part of Bianca's case. But let's be clear. This was way more than just these two little boys. If you recall, there was actually a task force set up to kind of get down to the nuts and bolts of what actually was going on. As part of that, in 2007, authorities looked at the possibility Michael Devlin maybe had a hand in Scott's disappearance. He was the one who kidnapped the two boys who were found later in his home. The task force disbanded because they couldn't find anything, you know, compelling. But on the other hand, they didn't rule him out either. So basically, you've got all these children going missing. They set up the task force. That's when they start looking at Michael Devlin. They found the two boys in his home. They've got this task force of all these other children. Is he involved? Couldn't find anything saying yes. Couldn't find anything saying no. So you had Bianca. You had Arlen. You had Scott. And then you have those two boys who were found in Devlin's house. But like Jen said, that is not it. So you also had... Cherie Barnes, Diana Brongart, Donna Mezzo, Gina Brooks, Heather Kalorn, TJ Davison, Cassidy Center. All of these, except for Heather and Cassidy, went missing between 1982 and 1989. That's a lot of people in a short time frame that are all minors. And Additionally, on top of that, so these are just the missing children. Two years after Scott goes missing, two other young boys were found murdered in the same woods where Scott often played. So the the woods where they're doing the search, where he's playing in caves and all that, two boys were found murdered. And this was Scott Pig, who was seven, and Benjamin Hurt, who was eight. Then a nine-year-old named Angie Hausman was murdered. And there's just so much going on in this area at this time. And on an unrelated note, for an unrelated reason, they actually ended up later leveling those woods. I They needed it for whatever. And the community was like, yes, please. You know, a lot of times the community will, will vote against or speak out against something like that because they're trying to preserve the area. They don't know what businesses are going to come in. But they were like, yes, too much has happened in those woods. Just take take it down. We don't care. So if you have any information about Arlen, please contact the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. They can be reached at area code 636-528-8546. Or if you have information about Scott, please reach out to St. Charles Police Department. Their number is area code 314-949-3300. Now, that's a lot of kids 
Well, you know, there's two things that stand out to me. So they, we talked about that one informant who had information on someone who killed minors and women within this time frame. And now police looked at it. They couldn't find anything. But what if there's some truth to that? You know, what if he really did hear something and police just haven't found yet what they need? So they, they're like, you know, we have nothing to go on at this point. But my gosh, that just seems so coincidental. And the other thing that stands out to me is in researching these cases, I've learned, and I did not know this, that actually a majority of people who go missing do end up being found. So for this many to go missing and they're still not found is just a very disturbing statistic. And not only that, there's no suspects in any of these cases. The best they've got is Michael Devlin, which they can't link to it. So not only is it all these kids, but there's no suspects in any of them. Like no one saw anything anywhere at any time. It's terrifying. Now, I, I was born in the 80s. I grew up in the 80s, and the rule was when the street light comes on or the porch light comes on, you come home. There was, we lived in a woodsy area. We were, li- we were stick people, <laughs> to be honest. We were backwoods people, accent included, insert your joke <laughs> now. But, you know, I just can't, I could not parent my children the way I was parented. Because it's a different time in different circumstances. I bet some of those parents were like, to those kids, you touch those woods. and I- Well, in fact, it's interesting you say that because when, the, when they were going to level the woods, there were these newspaper articles on newspapers.com, which, you know, archives all the old stuff, where there were people, kids, teenagers, talking about how my mom was like, you do not go in those woods. Families were speaking out saying, yes, please take these woods. And kids were saying, and I was not going to go against my mom's wishes because I know what happened out there. I know about the kids who were found murdered, about the kids who went missing. And now all of them were not in the woods. But I mean, think about the Bianca Piper. She She, had to walk past the woods. She, and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't these same woods, but Bianca was in a wooded area as well. And now these do span a few different cities, but think about it, Jen, you know, here in Birmingham, you've got Birmingham, Hoover, they're all in the same area basically, but they're different cities or, you know, think about um, Atlanta and Buckhead. Exactly. So kind of that same thing. So it's still the same area, but it's not. Does does that open up that possibility that you have a person traveling by foot or by car who liked to stay in the it just I mean it gives you complete cover it's crime of opportunity but it's also but speaking of crime of opportunity though you would have to be out in those woods all the time to catch these different kids i mean for heaven's sake there's a thunderstorm and in bianca's case it's freezing cold and snowing outside so is somebody yeah. really out there during all that you know what i'm saying or maybe they're just patrolling and they know the they know the area. They had to have known the areas. And, you know, you drive around my neighborhood, you can tell where the kids go. I yeah. mean, if you sit in your car and you watch, you know exactly which wood it because we have little woods around our place. You can like you can see the little trails with, where they go and it just I'm trying to come up with a theory or an idea of how this could happen and nobody see anything. The only thing that stands out to me, because again, we heard it in Bianca's case and then tonight, is a lot of people have mentioned these caves. So is someone in there? Is there some sort of drug hub there? You know, I, I don't know. But you keep hearing them talk about the caves in those cases, which seems to be a common factor as well. So could you know, could that have something to do with it? Now they search them, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily keeping them there. True. And there's so many of them. And in Bianca's area, there were so many abandoned houses because there was that part of that city that boomed when the plant was there. And when the plant shut down, a lot of the population moved out. So are we seeing that in these other little small towns where the there's a lot of abandoned homes or places where people could hide, essentially. Well, and there was that apartment complex being built as well. You know, the scent dogs lost the trail at the apartment complex being built. So again, could someone be 
hiding in there, staying in there, or exchanging drugs in there until it's built. You never know. It's just, it's absolutely terrifying because that is a lot of children at the same time in the same place. But on a more lighter side, we do need to give a special th- shout out and a special thank you to Melissa. She Woo. has joined us on the Patreon side of the house. She is now a delectable. Uh, Melissa, when you're hearing this, you should already have your little care package. So don't forget, if you want to be a Patreon, go to patreon.com slash corpus delicti, sign up. A dollar gets you all of the freebie stuff on the website, plus all of our episodes ad free, except for the ones that are embedded, like our promo swaps with other podcasters who, if we swap with them, we stand by them. They're awesome. And if you want to go to the $3 level, you are invited to join us on our Discord service, which is an app for your phone where you can chat with us. I'm not going to say 24-7 because I do sleep, but (laughs) we have some really great conversations on there. And don't forget, especially with Patreon, at any amount that you decide or to offer to give, you can join us for our monthly live Patreon events. Speaking of, that for this month is going to be on Tuesday the 29th at 7 p.m. Central Time. We did post it on Patreon, but just to remind you guys, so that is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. That is going to be the episode for the week after. But again, the Patreon part where we hang out with you guys and talk to you guys, that part will not be in it. It will just be the story. And again, just if there are new people We have time off because of Thanksgiving, Christmas, the Atlanta show and all that. And we didn't want to keep any of these missing person stories where not everyone can hear about it because we just believe that the exposure can be beneficial. So we decided that during some of that off time, we were going to release just the episodes from our Patreon live events. But we will still have time off in December after that. So, Oh, and one last housekeeping event. Guys, if you have not written yet and you wish to do so go to our facebook page and get one of the templates for rocky time is very precious and things are moving fast in alabama especially with the re-election of our governor so please we don't know when we don't know how and we don't know how long but it's getting kind of scary so if you support rocky like we do uh no pressure Go ahead and fill out that letter or template, or you can make one up on your own and mail it to us. Our post office box is in the show notes. And if you want, and it just, it's P.O. Box 89, Chelsea, Alabama 35043, if you don't know how to get to the show notes for whatever reason. And um, as always, Lindsay's still popping out those TikToks. I, I am, did too. You did <laughs> too, but it didn't say popping them out, but <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. And I am still doing those YouTube. So if you like to have something on in the background on your laptop, go for it. Or if we, you want to see love visuals, it. like Jen will include maps or, you know, things that may be pertinent to the case. Some of them are just, just graphics and visuals, but some of them are pertinent to the case. And also with that, keep in mind, we don't necessarily release YouTube at the same time as the episode. It may be a few days later just because that's a lot all at once, but they are always shortly behind. So yeah. Yeah. Give me grace. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because I don't, we don't have a producer. Give me some grace. (laughs) Actually, (laughs) funny story. Someone um, I was talking to yesterday asked how many people were on our team. And I said, oh, it's just me and Jen. And he was like, well, yeah, y'all are the hosts, but like who does all the editing and stuff? And I was like, oh, it's just me and Jen. (laughs) And he was like, oh my gosh, I would have thought y'all had people. It sounds so good. And I laughed because I was like, he must have missed the episodes where I left the lobster in. Thank God. (laughs) I I had to laugh. I was like, oh, thank you, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Like, are you being nice or are you being serious? I don't know. Yeah, like, are you mocking me or? (laughs) Well, guys, if We don't have another episode until then. Y'all have an amazing and safe holiday season, which includes any and all holidays that you celebrate. I will be stuffing my face with some turkey Mm -hmm. and some mashed potatoes, but you know what they said to Felicia. Bye. Bye.